Hi, thanks for tuning into this video. Today's video is rather unique. First of all, I don't know if you noticed, but we are not in the studio. This is my home office, so welcome to my home. Today's video is also unique in that it is a subject-based video, but specifically what I'm going to be doing today is what's called a didactic timeline. That's just a fancy word of just saying training tool. So I am going to do a timeline of the Old Testament. I don't know about you, but for me personally, the Old Testament is incredibly overwhelming. I mean, there's so much, more than two-thirds of this book is the Old Testament, and there's so much content that's in there. And it's not all organized in a chronological order. I mean, the Pentateuch, the first five books are in chronological order. And when you start at Genesis 1-1, you do start at the beginning with creation. But then it, it kind of jumps around and it, it's very confusing. So the purpose of this video is for me to give a 30,000 foot view of the entire Old Testament from a chronological point of view. So what I'm going to do is I am going to fly through and hit on all the major characters of the Old Testament in chronological order uh, from creation all the way up until the end of the Old Testament right before uh, Jesus and the New Testament comes into play. One of the things that I want to talk about before I get into this is, is, is a few things on dates. So first of all, I am using the dates as outlined in my uh, NIV specifically I have this is a uh, chronological Bible. Uh, it is a, it's organized uh, day by day in from a chron chronological perspective. The thing that's really cool about that is there's sections where you'll be jumping around and you'll have one section where it's from Kings and then the next little bit will be from uh, Chronicles and then you might have a Psalm that hops in there because all of those are inter interacting in the story plot line at the same time. So what I did to create this is I literally went through page by page and put together a timeline according to the NIV Chronological Bible. Okay, so let's get after it. Genesis. Genesis has some of my favorite stories in the Bible. You've got the story of um, Moses. I actually, from a Hollywood standpoint, I absolutely love uh, the DreamWorks version of um, Moses, the Prince of Egypt. Not uh, Exodus, where Batman plays Moses. Christian Bale's a phenomenal actor, but Hollywood messing with the Bible really bugs me. Same thing with Noah. Um, I really like Russell Crowe in Gladiator, but uh, the way that Hollywood portrayed Noah, you're better off just reading the flood story in Genesis 6 through 9 and don't watch uh, Noah with Russell Crowe. Uh, it's entertaining, but it's not really that biblical. So at any rate, sorry, that was a tangent, but... Um, so let's start with Genesis, and we're going to go through this. I'm going to fly, but we're going to have some fun, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully we have some fun. So in Genesis 1 and 2, we have the creation story, right? Adam and Eve in the garden. Then already, Genesis 3, three chapters in, we have the fall. Separation, man from God, and we're kicked out of, of Eden, and this then starts uh, what you will see throughout the entire Bible of a desire for God to reunite with his people. And in the Old Testament, we're going to look at that, and I'm going to wrap it back up around of how God does amazing things to bring us back to him. Okay, so you have the fall, then you have the flood, Genesis 6 through 9. Specifically looking at the flood, an interesting study is to ask the question, how were the people before the flood, and how are people now today? Just something to think about. Uh, next, you have the Tower of Babel. Following that, we go into the patriarchs. Now, the patriarchs specifically, you get Abraham, Father Abraham, followed by Isaac and Jacob, followed by Joseph, uh, and then Moses and Joshua. That's specifically when I say the patriarchs, and that covers a timeline where now we're talking 2166 B.C., through 1375 BC. As you recall with BC, as we get closer and closer to zero, we're actually counting down, and then when you get to AD, you're counting up. So let's talk about Abraham for a second. 2166, uh, Father Abraham is born, and now we have Genesis 11, all the way through Genesis 19 and 20, is the story of Abraham. 
Abraham is a phenomenal story. This is where we get the Abrahamic covenant in which God says to Abraham, Abram, uh, Abram, Abraham, Sarai, Sarah, those are the same individuals. Uh, just God changes their name through the story. But this is where we get the Abrahamic covenant, where God promises to Abraham that he will make a mighty nation out of him. And, and if you can count the stars, you can count the descendants. Same thing as the, the grains of sand on the seashore. And he promises, uh, he actually lays out the promised land to Abraham, uh, as well as that God says that he will bless the people who bless him and his people, and he'll curse those who curse him. This is the Abrahamic covenant. It's an unconditional covenant that still exists to this day. We also get at this time uh, some downsides. So uh, God promises Abraham that he's going to be a mighty nation, right? Well, Abraham gets uh, impatient and doesn't wait. And this is where you get the story of um, Hagar and Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael and Isaac are two of Abraham's sons and their feud between Ishmael and Isaac and their descendants still actually exists today and that's the foundation of the Arab-Israeli conflict. The sins, descendants of Ishmael are the Arabs, the descendants of Isaac are the Jews. Um, one of the things that I love about the Bible is that it doesn't pull any punches, right? You look at, we were talking about Egypt and how everything that's recorded only records the good things about the leaders. But our Bible records the good and bad of our historical figures. The father Abraham, the father of the Jews and the Christians, uh, screwed up. And the Bible talks about that. And I love that about the Bible. It makes it, it just grows the trust on, from me, I can trust the scriptures because it shows the humanity of these people. We are all sinful. Abraham was sinful. King David, who we're going to talk about in just a minute, was a sinful guy. He screwed up as well. He was a man after God's own heart. The ultimate king of Israel, King David, screwed up. And the Bible talks about that. So the patriarchs you have after uh, Abraham, he has the two sons. You've got Isaac and uh, uh, Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Now we're about 2006 BC. Uh, and the story can be found in Genesis 25, but it also can be found in 1 Chronicles. And I want to mention right now, we've just been talking about the book of Genesis, but I want to add in Chronicles 1 and 2. Uh, it's actually just one book, but it's divided into Chronicles 1 and 2. Chronicles, um, it actually, the, the term Chronicles translates in Hebrew to the events or annals uh, of the days or years. So it outlines um, all the way from Abraham to the divided kingdom. Uh, the extent of our timeline today is covered in Chronicles. So as I'm going to go through this, there's going to be times at which uh, I mention Genesis, but it's also in Chronicles. I'll mention 1 Kings, but it's also in Chronicles. I'll mention 2 Kings, but it's also in Chronicles. So Chronicles covers the whole timeline uh, and gives you, so you know, have two sources of information uh, of validity to back each other up, right? Okay, so now we have Jacob and the story of Leah and Rachel. Poor Leah. The Bible pulls no punches on her. Uh, she wasn't pleasant to look at. Uh, and the Bible specifically says that. Jacob is all about Rachel and Rachel's dad is all about marrying off his other daughter, Leah, before he marries off Rachel. That's a fun story. You can find that in Genesis 29, 14 through 30. Jacob through Leah and Rachel, because uh, their father tricks Jacob and he ends up marrying both of them, uh, has 12 sons. These 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob, his name is changed to Israel and he becomes the nation Israel with the 12 tribes. Now, one of those sons of his 12 sons is Joseph. And this is where we get the story of Joseph uh, and the technicolor uh, um, uh, dream coat. But Joseph, as you recall the story, he gets sold into slavery. Uh, that's in 1898 BC and taken as a slave into Egypt. 
But Joseph is a type of Jesus. And what I mean simply by that is that when you look through the Bible, there's types, characters in the Bible that portray a lot of similarities to Christ. And Joseph is, is one of those uh, Christ-like characters. The Bible doesn't know anywhere in which he sins. He does because he is human. But you can look at Joseph as a great, uh, a great man in Israeli history. But through that story, Israel, Jacob, and the 12 sons end up coming into Egypt. And that's how the people of Israel end up in Egypt is the story of Joseph. It's a wonderful, and actually there is a good movie done by the same DreamWorks crew that did Prince of Egypt. And I think um, Ben Affleck is actually the voice uh, for Joseph. And I want to say Mark Hamill, uh, Luke Skywalker, is one of the voices of one of the brothers. Uh, I'm fairly certain of that. Um, you should check it out. It's a good animated movie. Uh, it, it's pretty old, but it's, it's, it's accurate. So this is where the book of Exodus picks up. Genesis is done. We pick up the book of Exodus uh, around 1526 BC. Now we get into the story of Exodus, the time uh, that Israel is in Egypt and Moses now comes onto the scene. This is where you get the story of the Prince of Egypt. Phenomenal. I think Val Kilmer is the voice. I don't know why I'm talking about Hollywood movies so much, but he's the voice of Moses. Does a phenomenal job. Um... So you can find that in Exodus 1 through 15 is the story of Exodus. Uh, the plagues pick up at Exodus 7. The first Passover is Exodus 12. And also with the first Passover, you do have the final plague. The part of the Red Sea, that happens at Exodus 14, uh, 15 through 31. And at 1446 BC is when we have the Exodus of Israel from Egypt. This is also where you get the Ten Commandments. That's in Exodus chapter 20. We also get the tabernacle system as well as a detailed outline of the law. And we have coverage in Exodus 25 through 31, Exodus 35 through 40, also number 7, 8, and 9, as well as the entire book of Leviticus covers specifically details of how God wants his people, Israel, to live, to be holy, to be his holy chosen people. So all of those scriptures go back and forth and give the law. Now we have the desert wanderings. This happens from 1446 roughly to 1406, 40 years in which Israel wanders in the desert. And this is where you get the book of Numbers, which documents that entire time of that 40 years. One interesting story that I, I love, it's just a small little chunk, but it's found in Numbers 21.8. Do you recognize this symbol? Well, by now, that symbol is plastered on so many hospitals and ambulances, that story of the bronze snake on a pole can be found in Numbers 21.8. I suggest you read it. It gives a foundation for why it is that, that so many... Um, ambulances have that symbol and the foundation of it. The thing is, is that when you study it, just the Old Testament point of view from Numbers, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Why would God tell Moses to shape a bronze snake onto a pole and then have the people look at it to be healed? It doesn't make any sense, especially when idolatry is specifically outlawed by the law. Jesus in the New Testament, specifically uh, in John 3.14, explains the significance of that. So I would check that out. Numbers 21.8 as well as John 3.14. Okay, we're now at 1405 BC. Moses dies and he passes the torch, so to speak, to Joshua, who takes over, and Israel finally is able to enter the Promised Land. But before Moses dies, he writes Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is a wrap-up of the Pentateuch, and uh, it's also the final instructions and a phenomenal recap of the entire Pentateuch. It's Moses' love letter, so to speak, to Israel, and specifically uh, the Song of Moses, which you can read in Deuteronomy 3130, 
through 3247 is one of my favorite passages that Moses writes. It's this poem that he writes specifically of God's love um, and for his care for Israel as a people. That's the song of Moses, Deuteronomy 31, 30 through 32. Psalm 90 is also written by Moses. So we're jumping in here. We're now in the book of Psalms, which is a phenomenal uh, uh, compilation that jumps all throughout the Old Testament as well from a chronological standpoint. So Psalm 90 is written by Moses at the end of his life. Joshua takes over as um, Israel enters the promised land, right? And that picks it up on Joshua 1. Uh, Joshua is an amazing commander um, who leads Israel uh, in the seven-year conquest of the Promised Land. We get uh, the fall of Jericho. Phenomenal story. That's at the beginning of Joshua. You get Ai, the story of Ai, the story of Achan. That's all in, in Joshua. And by the end of Joshua, you have the entire region of Canaan, the promised land, has now been divided up by the 12 tribes of Israel. It's all divided up. Each is its own little city-state. They're all, not all united yet at this point. But that leads us into the period of the Judges. This takes us from 1375 BC to 1055 BC, a period of roughly 200 years. The Judges period is a period in which God puts in place leaders, the judges, to guide Israel, to help Israel um, on its path. To, and the judges, uh, for the most part, um, call Israel to repent and to return to God. Uh, a key verse for the book of Judges is Judges 2.16. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of raiders, that saved Israel out of the hand of raiders, Yet they, the people, would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. So you got Deborah on the scene in Judges 4 as a judge, and then Gideon is uh, the next judge at Judges, judges 6. I'm saying judge a lot. Right here, I'm going to interject and put the book of Ruth in. And the reason why I want to put it right here is, is that from a chronological standpoint, the story of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz takes place in the late Judges period. You also find Ruth uh, in uh, 1 Chronicles 2, chapter 2, verses 9 through 17, when you are getting the, um, the genealogy that includes Ruth uh, and Boaz, which leads to um, Obed and Jesse and King David which actually eventually leads to Jesus, is a descendant going all the way through. So Ruth is in, I don't know how, he's, she is Jesus's great, 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 great grandma. Okay, continue on with the judges. 1080 BC, we get Samson on the scene. I love Samson, I love his stories. Don't know how good of a judge the guy was. Uh, I mean, he was supposed to be, follow the Levitical uh, uh, priesthood system and he doesn't. Um, and he's not the best leader in the sense of a uh, spiritual mentor or leader, but he is a mighty warrior. He's kind of like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Dwayne the Rock Johnson mixed together, but Jewish. Uh, interesting thing to Google is what is the Samson option for Israel today? It's an interesting thing to Google. It correlates back to how Samson actually dies. Uh, and the number of uh, enemies he takes out with him in the process. Next up, uh, 1070 BC, you have Samuel is the final judge in the book of Judges. Now, at this point, we see Israel as a people complaining to God and complaining to Samuel that they want a king. They want a king is not necessarily, they're wanting a king is not necessarily a bad thing, but Israel wants a king that can go and fight for them. And uh, Moses specifically warned about this. Um, and the kings that they end up with, uh, historically speaking, um, David is a great king. He still screws up, but pretty much all the other ones, uh, uh, especially when you get the divided monarchy, are really messed up uh, and evil kings. So we now get into Samuel uh, and uh, 1 Samuel 8, 
you see Israel wanting a king. And then in 1050 BC, Samuel notes, anoints King Saul, which you can find that in 1 Samuel 10. You can also find that in 1 Chronicles 9. Um, and this then starts the united monarchy. Saul's life as king starts out good, does not end up that way. Um, and from 1050 to 1010 is Saul's reign. And you can find that in, in the book of uh, 1 Samuel. Samuel anoints King David uh, at 1 Samuel 16. Uh, he anoints him as the future king. But then you have the story of David and Goliath, which is a phenomenal story, which I personally love. Uh, that's 1 Samuel 17. And then David becomes this mighty warrior. And the problem is, is that uh, he starts killing uh, Philistines and all the enemies of Israel like crazy, and he makes King Saul jealous. And as a result, there's this whole period of time at which David, who is the future king, is pursued by Saul, who's trying to kill him, because uh, Saul wants to, to have the throne and all the glory. Uh, and you get in the Psalms, I'm going to interject the Psalms in now, Psalm 57, Psalm 59, Psalm 142, all written by David, specifically as it correlates to him running from or hiding from uh, King Saul as he's hunting him down. Saul does die at the end of 1 Samuel, and we pick it up at 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles also outlines David's reign, King David's reign, which is from 1010 BC to 970 BC. This is where you have Israel truly united under one king that they love, and he unites Israel, um, I want to say, unlike it's been united since. Uh, under his rule, you do see the David Davidic covenant, uh, which is in 2 Samuel 7. You also do uh, find the story of Bathsheba uh, and Uriah the Hittite, who is her husband, uh, and the story of David seeing uh, Bathsheba bathing on the roof and him lusting after, killing Uriah the Hittite, and then bringing uh, Bathsheba into his house. Uh, that's in 2 Samuel 11. Psalm 51 is a phenomenal psalm to read. That actually is written by David after he gets called out by Nathan in the sin that he has committed against uh, Bathsheba and against Uriah the Hittite. Okay, continuing on. Um, now we get uh, David's son, actually from Bathsheba, is Solomon. And Solomon, uh, his reign was from 970 BC to 930 BC. That's documented in 1 Kings as well as in 1 Chronicles. Um, and his reign starts out great. Solomon the wise, um, he, uh, God offers him anything he wants and he asks for wisdom. His reign starts out really good, but Solomon becomes the most richest, the richest man that has ever lived more than Gates, uh, more than Bezos, more than Elon Musk, more than any of them. The amount of wealth that Israel had as a nation and Solomon had, um, has yet to be surpassed. And with that came pride and his great fall was idolatry. The dude had 700 wives and then on top of that he had 300 concubines. And at the end of his life, he writes the book of Ecclesiastes, which Ecclesiastes is uh, not a long read. Um, it's entertaining and it's pretty much summed up in the very first few chapters in which Solomon says, meaningless, meaningless, Everything is utterly meaningless. Solomon has everything. He's got a thousand wives. Uh, he's got more money than anyone has ever had. He has everything that he could possibly want. And he realizes that life without God is without meaning. The pursuit of wealth, the pursuit of lust, the pursuit of all those things is meaningless. Ecclesiastes ends very well, though. And it, it wraps back up simply with a, a callback to God at the end, which I love that. So that's where Ecclesiastes enters in there. Then you get um, Solomon's son, Rehoboam. 
he takes uh, the throne in 930, and this is where you get the dividing of the kingdom. Under Solomon, and under David, and under Saul, you had a united Israel. The north and the south was united together. With uh, Rehoboam, you get a division. And this is where it gets a bit more complicated, um, and you get um, all of these kings of the north, Israel, and of the south, Judah. This is where for me early on, I got really confused because it's like, wait, you're talking about Israel, but then you talk about Jerusalem and you talk about the kings of Judah, but then you talk about the kings of Israel. But isn't Israel also Judah and isn't Judah also Israel? No, it's the divided. The north is uh, Israel, south is Judah. And you have the period of the kings, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, as well as Chronicles, uh, 2 Chronicles, as well as uh, the end of uh, 1 Chronicles, um, covers this time frame, which really, uh, it, it, it goes from 931 BC to 722 BC for the Northern Kingdom and to 586 BC for the Southern Kingdom. So what I have up right now is a listing of some of the kings, not all of them, because that example that I gave earlier on, some of the kings only ruled for like a month or six months. And so th this just has a listing of the kings of the northern kingdom, uh, Israel and the kings of the southern kingdom, Judah. Um, some important things to note here. The fall of the northern kingdom happens in 722 by the Assyrians. The Assyrians take over the entire Canaan region except for the southern kingdom of Judah. They hold out almost as this little island completely is surrounded by the Assyrian kingdom. Then the Babylonians take over, and in 586 BC, uh, Judah, the remainder of Israel as a people, is taken into captivity, and this is what's called the exile. That happens in 586 uh, BC is the destruction of the temple. Um, 605 is the first uh, deportation of Judah. Uh, and then 596 is the second deportation to um, Babylon. And then you get uh, at 586 the destruction of Solomon's temple. Um, oh, I forgot to mention that, didn't I? I totally did. I totally miss, missed that. I apologize. Under Solomon's reign, um, I, I jumped in there. Let's back up just a little bit. Right before um, Ecclesiastes and all of his wealth, I missed two notes. I apologize. 966 BC, you have the first temple being built. Now, this is at the end of 1 Chronicles, and uh, as well as 2 Chronicles and 1 Kings covers uh, the building of the temple. You also have Proverbs being written mostly by Solomon, but others did include that, and Song of Songs is written by uh, Solomon. Okay, so uh, King Solomon's temple uh, is ultimately destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, uh, King Nebi, Nebuchadnezzar is not just a ship from uh, the Matrix. Uh, that's where they got that name. Um, so King Nebuchadnezzar destroys uh, King Solomon's temple in, in 586. So what might seem in the period of the kings as uh, a horrible time in Israel's past where these kings are very evil, uh, selfish, and, and the kingdom is divided, in this time you have the time of the prophets. This is a period at which God sent down the prophets to call Israel as a people to repent. The nation Israel, the, the tribe Israel in the north and, and Judah in the south to repent, to return to uh, Yahweh and to follow his teaching. And sometimes they listen and sometimes they don't. So here is a list of all the prophets. This is in chronological order of when they were a prophet. Now, I've divided this up into three groups. You have the um, pre-exilic prophets, who they were the prophets from 800-ish uh, B.C. to 722 B.C. It's Joel, Amos, uh, Hosea, and Jonah. And their voice is one uh, that speaks out of repent or else. 
this coming doom, it's coming, it's looming, something bad is going to happen. Repent, return to the Lord, return to the law. Then you have this middle section, which is interesting because it exists in between uh, the northern tribe, uh, the northern kingdom being sacked, destroyed, and those tribes of Israel being annihilated. The lost tribes of Israel are gone. Um, so you have this period between 722 um, and uh, uh, 587 in which the south tribe still exists of Judah. And so these prophets speak a word of warning. You see what happened? This could happen to you. So repent. Then you get the post-exilic prophets, which covers from um, the exile, the beginning of the exile uh, at uh, 722. Uh, excuse me, at 587 uh, to the end uh, of the exile with Malachi are those prophets. And their voice is one saying, uh, repent and return to God. Um, and a foreshadowing of uh, good things to come, um, so to speak, and a return of a king that will unite Israel together. Uh, a coming king will come. Uh, to do that. So in this, you have Daniel, uh, who is the one who interprets dreams, as you recall, with King Nebuchadnezzar, um, uh, as well as the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, with Jesus, actually. That's a, a Christophany exists there in the story of them being in the furnace. Uh, that's in Daniel 3. You also have in Daniel 6, the story of Daniel in the lion's den, um, etc. So that it covers the prophets, covers that whole period of time. Um, then you have the return to Jerusalem. And this is where you have, uh, in 537 BC, you have Zerubbabel and Joshua returning. Uh, in 536 to 517, you have the temple being rebuilt. That's covered in the book of Ezra. Then in 486 to 465, we have Esther's story, uh, which takes place uh, in Persia, uh, but that happens in that same timeline. And then in 450, we have Ezra uh, returning and the covenant reestablished and the law is found and read again. And, and Ezra's like, wow, hey, look what I found. Maybe we should follow this again. And then in 445, Nehemiah returns and the wall is built and that's covered in the book of Nehemiah. This wraps up the Old Testament. I apologize if I skipped a story, but I was trying to flat, uh, fly through the whole thing. There's a period of roughly 400 years until the New Testament picks it up. And the Old Testament uh, really is left as a cliffhanger because you, you have the people reuniting um, in Jerusalem, um, but all throughout the Old Testament, there's these prophecies and this foreshadowing of a coming figure, uh, of a new system. When you look at the Old Testament, testament is also a word for covenant. You have the covenantal system, right? We have the Abrahamic covenant. We have the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant. And each of those is a covenant between God and Israel. In some cases, such as the Abrahamic covenant, is a one-way covenant made between God and Israel in which the people, the Israels don't have to do anything uh, and God will fulfill his covenant. But then you have the Mosaic covenant which that very much is a, if you do this, uh, then this will happen. But if you don't do this, then this will happen. And that's where you have the prophets coming in saying, uh, repent, return to God. When you look at the law, which when I speak of the law, I'm talking about the, the Pentateuch and uh, the, the, the covenantal system. It creates this drive to try to be perfect. But the one thing we learn from the law, and the New Testament will attest to this, uh, you, you get verses all over the place that, that, that back this up. The one thing we learn from the law is that we can't do it. We can't be perfect. No one fulfilled the law perfectly, except for Jesus. That's where Jesus comes on the scene. But if you don't look at the New Testament or the New Covenant, Israel is, is left at this precipice where it's just like, well, what, 
What's supposed to happen now? I mean, they're waiting. Israel as a people today are waiting for the Messiah. They are waiting for this coming world leader that will unite Israel together and will bring Israel back as a nation. The thing is, is that's Jesus. And that's the new covenant and the new testament. Jesus specifically said at the Last Supper, uh, when he used the, the, the cup and the bread uh, and communion, and to do that in remembrance of a new covenant made in his blood and in his body, and the sacrifice that he made to reunite us together. As I said at the very beginning, the story of the Bible is a story that, that, that goes from Genesis 3 all the way until Revelation of an amazing God who wants to be reunited with us, who wants us to be reunited with him. One of my favorite verses uh, is specifically from Revelation. It's Revelation 3.20, in which God says, Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. And those who hear my voice and open the door, I will come and eat with them and they with me. The Old Testament is a, a, a grouping of these amazing stories that show the character of not only God, but the character of us. You look at Israel and you look at all the mistakes that they make. You look at all of the issues and all the backsliding that they do. It's very easy for us to judge them and, and, and to, to uh, question, well, come on, they saw, specifically, if you look at uh, the wandering and the exile, and uh, not, not the exile, um, Exodus, they saw miracles firsthand. They saw a pillar of fire leading them uh, at night and a pillar of cloud leading them during the day. You're literally following God. And yet, they backslide. And the, the point that I'm getting at, and I apologize that I'm rambling, is, is that we are just as bad today. So when you look at the Old Testament and you look at Israel, you look at the story of mankind. So I hope that this has been helpful to be able to see a chronological layout of the Old Testament. Uh, we're getting back to our usual studies next week. Uh, I'm going to be, excuse me, not next week, uh, in, a, in a handful of days, uh, I'm going to be picking it back up in Romans. If you haven't joined us, uh, I do a weekly Bible study. Uh, every Wednesday night, there's a Bible study that, that uh, I put up. And right now we're going through Romans. We're on Romans 5. So uh, I will actually include a link uh, right down here at the end of this video to that uh, uh, the, the Romans Bible study. Um, I also invite you to subscribe. Thank you very much, and I hope this has been helpful.